In this video, I'm going to talk about species being and um, and so this is, you know, the very uh, foundation of of uh, production uh, from this Marxist perspective. Okay, so species being. Um, and uh, one thing that I want to emphasize here in in looking at these schematics uh, is that I want you to think of them as uh, dynamic. Think of the way that you know things are flowing. There's lots of arrows, and we want to think about those dynamic flows. Um, and you know, this is we're talking about like the origins of production. How do we get from just being Homo sapiens uh, emerging as a species? to then to the level of industrial production that's characteristic of capitalism. Um, so all these forms are, are like transitional forms with a view towards uh, industrial capitalism. Okay, so at a very fundamental level, human survival uh, relies upon the ecology. You have to have an ecology that supports human life. And then, um, and then from the ecology, human beings can put in a certain amount of labor in order to uh, get the products out of the ecology that they need. Uh, and they need those products because they need to consume them primarily in the form of food, right? Human beings need to survive and they need to eat. And, and in order to eat, which is necessary for life, it's necessary to produce products out of the ecology. And in order to produce products that you eat primarily or help you to otherwise, you know, uh, survive in the ecology, uh, there's a certain amount of necessary labor. Um, so, for example, let's say, um, and, 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 and um, sometimes when we think back to the early Homo sapiens, um, you know, so there's, there's uh, at one stage along the line in, in human evolution, there's a species called uh, Homo erectus, um, and so upright. Uh, human um, or humanoid, um, uh, and this is before Homo sapiens, and um, so there's still some evolution to go through before we get to people that look like us. But uh, Homo erectus, even at that stage of the game, because they walked upright and had um, physical features in their lower body very much like us and their torso and, and their lower body looked very much very much human um, brain was smaller and and culturally they didn't seem to have um, you know as high an intellect as homo sapiens but um, but they had the physique to make um, survival pretty basic and this is in africa so homo sapiens were largely confined to Africa until about um, 70,000 years ago. Uh, and we're thinking now with Homo erectus, I think something like uh, two million years ago or a million years ago, okay? Um, so let's say a million years ago, I, I don't wanna look it up right now, but uh, something like that. Um, but even at that, uh, just the basic, uh, evolutionary um, development to where you have an erect uh, humanoid uh, species living in Africa becomes incredibly uh, uh, fairly straightforward <laughs> because um, you have lots of large game, lots, lots of large animals. And one way that uh, even tribes people in Africa to this day, one way that they hunt, and this would be fully available to Homo erectus, is that 
you just uh, chase, uh, you know, a water buffalo. Let's say you have a water buffalo and a big, massive creature, um, and and they're afraid of humans. They don't. They run away from humans. So, so what you do is you just start chasing a water buffalo. You get it separated off from its herd, and you start chasing it and chasing it across the landscape. And one thing that's, uh, you know, maybe Homo erectus wasn't uh, as adapted to this as Homo sapiens because they're a little hairier and didn't quite have the cooling system, but but relatively close. And um, and so tribesmen even to th to this day do this is they just jog and chase that. Uh, water water buffalo all day long because that's something that that erect humanoids can do is you don't have to do it you don't have to run fast uh, but you know humans can obviously run marathons and uh, water buffalo and other animals lots of animals are, have the same situation you could even do it with an elephant but elephants can get pretty uh, angry um, but um, but other animals, other mammals don't have the cooling system. You know, they have all this fur, they have lots of fat, this, you know, and they're not made to run all day. And so what happens is an animal will just go into heat stroke and fall over and, um, and sometimes just die just like that. Or if, if they don't, not, aren't dead, they're, then they're easy to, you know, stick with spears and kill them off. Uh, and, and that's a lot of food and just requires a, a, a day of jogging. And so um, way back in the evolutionary history of human beings, this was, was available, but it just required, it was necessary to do that all day jog. Um, and then you have to, um, you have to butcher the animal um, normally, you know, and we do find evidence of, of even 4 million years ago with, uh, Australopithecus, um, the so-called Lucy, um, um, uh, fossils that were found, uh, of Australopithecus, which was a very short, uh, is the, the one that was originally found uh, was a woman, was a female, a very short, uh, somewhat erect posture, but very hairy, so more very closer to ape, but um, but definitely humanoid. And and even at that stage of the game, uh, we find evidence of butchering animals, uh, and so so we have. Um, that's four million years ago, um, and in order to butcher the animals, you need an, an implement, a cutting, a knife, to to butcher the animal. Uh, and these early humanoid uh, species uh, were able to make a very effective. Uh, knife implements out of stone, out of flint stone, and they learn to to knock uh, knock the, the flint stone uh, with other stones and chip away um, parts of the flint stone so that it it makes a very sharp edge. So they cut it on each side. And it's not an easy process. Modern people, uh, modern anthropologists, and paleontologists have learned to do this, and it, and it takes, um, you know, uh, like a thousand hours to learn how to do this properly. But but these humanoids from way back then um, regularly did this and made um, hand axes, as they're called, and these can be used for you know chopping wood or whatever, but also for um, butchering animals and preparing hides to then provide clothing and things like that. Um, so, so you have some um, pretty sophisticated uh, characteristics of species being, as Marx calls it, um, uh, going back millions of years. 
and um, and then this basic picture that Marx talks about necessary labor, necessary products for necessary consumption, all based in the ecology, which he doesn't talk about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And, and Marx kind of envisions this as a thought experiment, uh, but uh, in in subsequent decades, and of course Darwin had already published um, at the time that Marx was writing, so you know it wasn't like uh, Marx was like uh, uh, pre envisioning um, evolution, evolutionary theory had already taken hold, and and of course Darwin was an English writer, and and Marx was living in London and, you know, in, in a social circle of intellectuals. So Darwinism uh, was definitely known to him and something that was shaping the way that people thought about things. So Darwin was thinking, in, or sorry, Marx was thinking in Darwinian terms, um, but the evidence hadn't been collected yet. But all the evidence, you know, supports the way that Marx is thinking about things. Okay, so now the the big thing that then Marx wants to talk about is not just day by day living off the land in this very primitive way. Um, he also says, okay, the reason why the reason why you have necessary consumption that you eat is just to do it all over again. You're reproducing your labor by eating the the food that you catch and then that allows you to go out the next day and do an all-day jog and and do it all over you know we may not have to do it even every day right this is this is one thing that we find about these uh, primitive lifestyles is that uh, there's a lot of leisure time uh, because you know they're just subsisting at what we would consider a very uh, you know, low standard of living, but but um, but the benefit is that there's a lot of leisure time. So maybe you only have to hunt a buffalo, uh, you know, every week. I don't know, depending on how how big, um, how many mouths you have to feed, right? But um, but even with children, you know, you you raise children, and okay, at, at first they're a burden, but soon you know you have a son or daughter that can uh, that can go out and and do the jog as well and and maybe you don't even have to go out they can do it for you so uh, this is all you know reproduction of labor and and this is a key this is perhaps the the, the most important concept in marxism is this idea of the re reproduction of labor um, the reproduction of labor and the re reproduction of the means of production. Okay, so, uh, but those are those are closely related, as we will see. Now, uh, one thing with labor is that it's not just consistent. It's not like you, uh, like when you when you labor for a day. You could labor for a couple of hours and get something done and then take the rest of the day off, or you can work all day. You can work a 12 hour day. And so the amount of labor available on any given day, even for just one person is very variable. You know, if we're just, <clears throat> if we're just worried about getting one um, water buffalo and that's gonna feed our family and, and, and we're good to go, um, then that's all the labor we have to do. But um, but maybe we we uh, are able to kind of chase two water buffalo simultaneously, and then you know the the group hunting them, uh, you know maybe at some point one of the buffalo drops from heat exhaustion, and so part of the the hunting group takes care of that buffalo and takes them back to to home but then but then the rest of the group goes on and maybe that takes a lot maybe that takes all day and so you have these variations that naturally occur and um then you know you just take 
you take advantage of circumstances and maybe put in a little bit more labor this day than you than you normally would. And Marx identifies this as a key component of 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 uh, of labor that it's variable. And it can even vary in intensity so that um, uh, you know, maybe on a particular day, the hunting group is feeling uh, strong and they just they just run faster and get the the water buffalo to keel over quicker. So just by the intensity of their labor, they can get the whole thing done quicker and produce more, you know, use super, super uh, surplus labor. So surplus is over and above what is necessary to reproduce the labor in the first place. So there's a certain amount of consumption that you need to do in order to be healthy for, for the next day of labor. And that requires all this green cycle of necessary labor, necessary products, and necessary consumption in order to reproduce the labor. But some days you're going to put in more work, either in terms of hours or in terms of intensity. And that's extra labor over and above what you really what is really necessary to survive. And that leads to surplus products, more products than what uh, are needed for basic survival. And now the big question arises. In a tribe, in this primitive sort of lifestyle, hunter-gatherer type uh, lifestyle, the question is, how do you distribute this extra food or extra uh, other products, extra clothing, where does the surplus go? And so that's our big question. That's, that's, that's the big question that Marx is focused on. How is this, the extra, the surplus distributed? Okay, so this is species being at a very uh, fundamental level. And this is our foundational form of production. So everything from here on out has this at its core. So even in, in industrial capitalism, this basic structure remains at the core of it. Um, and we have our fundamental question, the distribution of the surplus. And what I want to uh, emphasize here is that this gap between necessary production versus surplus production, uh, that's a dynamic gap. So it opens up and then it'll close naturally, opens up and closes naturally. There's kind of a rhythm to it. Um, and this, this um, rhythm is determined by uh, demographic Sort of, sort of issues. So let, let's take a look at that um, as we move forward. Now, the way that this gap closes is if the distribution of the surplus gets distributed into what becomes necessary product, uh, necessary consumption, meaning that if the distribution is primarily back into those who uh, do the labor, so like the hunters, and you give them, if the hunters go out, they get extra food than what is needed and extra subsequent products, you know, if that distribution of the surplus goes back to those hunters and maybe, you know, uh, also to feed they were talking about elderly people and things like that. If that if that goes back to the general population of the tribe, then that's going to cause this dynamic gap to close. Um, and and so that's what we're we're kind of envisioning at this stage of the game is that primarily okay maybe there is a chief of the tribe, 
and the chief reserves uh, some of the surplus for themselves, but predominantly the surplus goes back to the entire tribe. And that means that people have more babies and then there's more mouths to feed. And now the necessary consumption is for this larger tribe, which requires more necessary labor uh, to get the necessary products to, for the necessary consumption in order to reproduce the labor and keep the whole thing going. Um, and, and this is about survival. It's, it's necessary because this is how the tr a, a large, now a larger tribe continues to sustain itself as a larger tribe. If they don't reproduce labor and do the necessary labor, then the tribe is going to shrink because babies are going to start to die and grandmas are going to start to die. Uh, but once they get this larger tribe, now there's no surplus. Now they have to get two water buffalo a day every day. Right? They have to do what was extra at one point. Now is just the baseline, and that's not extra. That's just necessary to keep everybody alive. Um, so uh, our our dynamic gap closed, but then you know they can start to do variable labor and put in more intensity or more hours and get some surplus products at some point. And then the big question becomes, how do we distribute it? And this can keep cycling through and cycling through. And um, so this is what like, you know, a hunter gatherer tribe would look like doing variable labor once in a while, uh, or getting lucky and, and getting more um, surplus products. And then if that gets distributed back to the tribe in general, which you know, in tribal societies, that tends to be what happens. Then you get more mouths to feed, and then you gotta you gotta keep up with that uh, level of production. And it keeps going, to where this dynamic gap opens up and closes down, and goes forward like that. All right. So um, now we in tribal societies there is some personal accumulation, so that um, people start to, uh, you know, they get, and if we're thinking of hunter gatherers, these are people that are on the move, they're nomadic. So, but they start to uh, uh, build and acquire tents that are then very mobile, so they can, they can follow herds of, of large game. And uh, they start to accumulate hand axes or more sophisticated tools as we get uh, uh, into like 70,000 years ago. And um, they have children, children have little toys and you know, all this sort of stuff. Uh, they start to accumulate stuff and um, that's just natural. Uh, and then at some point, you know, maybe I have made a hand axe and, uh, or, or some uh, more sophisticated form of axe, you know, if we're thinking about Homo sapiens 70,000 years ago, maybe a hand, a hand axe like I described before, but now attached to a handle and it really looks something like an axe. Uh, still Stone Age technology, but, but, um, but, uh, uh, something that takes some sort of skill to, to build correctly. And maybe I'm making, I have an old axe, but I'm making a new one because I want a really nice new axe, but I have this extra old axe that's still pretty good and it's, and I don't really need it. It's surplus to me. Then I might trade it with somebody else. And, um, and in these tribal societies, the way that that t tends to work because um, we have in the 20th century, we had a lot of tribal societies um, still existing. And so anthropologists were able to, to study them pretty closely and, and see the way that their economies worked. And, uh, and some of these tribes still exist today, but, um, but uh, often the way this would work when they exchange surplus products, they would, they would give the, the extra acts like as a gift. So I have my friend, uh, my buddy, and you know, 
that's that's always uh, has his tent right next to mine, and we're we always sit around the fire, and we're good buddies. And so, you know, I say, hey, you know what? I got this extra axe. You can have it. Um, and so, my buddy's like, great, thank you. And and uh, and then that's that's it. Except that now my buddy feels obligated to give me something, you know, not necessarily on the same day, but in some some amount of time and and you know there's sort of social conventions for the way this plays out uh, but at some point he feels obligated to give me something that's that's similar you know that he can give as a gift and so you know human beings just naturally do this this is part of the very being the nature of our species and so we start to exchange products the surplus products from our variable labor you know i didn't I didn't have to make another axe. I still had an axe that was that was fine, but I put in extra labor for a, a few days in order to make another uh, another axe. That was variable labor on my part. I end up with an extra axe, and then I can give that as a gift. Okay. Um, So when my buddy gives, when my buddy gives me a gift in return for my gift, he's going to try to uh, give me something that's equal in value. And of course, in our society, we would think of value in terms of money, the price. But in this society, there's no money happening. It's just goods. And so the exchange value is more, you know, what is, my buddy doesn't make axes, right? He, that's just not something he does. That's why he needs one and I give him one. Um, so he's not going to make, and, and I don't need an axe because I have an ex, I already have one. He has one. We both have axes now. Now he has to figure out something that's somewhat uh, of the same value that he can produce. Okay. And so that's exchange value, and that's the way we normally think about um, about the exchange of surplus products in, in the capitalist society is the value is the price, but, but that's not really operating here. The real thing that's operating is the use value. So this is a concept that uh, Marx uh, clearly identifies, is that the hand axe, this axe that I, I made and gave to my buddy, it has a use value. He can actually use it to do things, uh, to carry out his natural inclination uh, of, of his species being. And it's the use value that's most important uh, in a product, not the price. You know, price is a whole different thing. Exchange value is different. Um, but it's really the use. And so, so at this very primitive stage of the game, you know, my buddy is just thinking, okay, what can Rodney use that's kind of like as useful as an ax, okay? Um, and notice in all this, this gift giving and exchange, um, so, uh, social relationships are expressed. I'm expressing my friendship with my buddy by giving him an axe and then he's going to reciprocate and that's part of what makes us buddies you know and so we're building this social relationship uh, through the exchange of of surplus products okay uh and and you know if i if i gave my extra axe to somebody else that would be a signal to my buddy that maybe we're not as good friends as he thought. Right? So the exchange of surplus products is a way of, of signaling um, social relationships. And then of course, you know, there might be a chief or something where lots of people are giving the chief gifts. Um, and then he's accumulating a lot and that's part of what makes him the chief, right? And so the, the, the position of the chief, part, that social status, part of the way that it's established is through uh, these exchange um, 
this exchanging of surplus products uh, as a as a an expression of social status. All right. And so that's it for species being. Um, we will move on to uh, primitive production next. Okay, see ya.